Okay, so we're going to talk about the gut-brain axis. And this actually should be dedicated to, to women because women have known basically forever that they have an intuition or a gut sense. And guys have always laughed at them that that's ridiculous. Uh, but in fact, um, with each passing year and with more and more research, we're beginning to realize that we have two brains. And years ago, there was a, quite a popular book called The Second Brain which detailed the fact that there are more neurons, the cell of the nervous system, lining your gut than there are in the entire spinal cord, which connects the brain to all the rest of you. So the, the phrase was coined the second brain. But in fact, uh, I'm gonna make an argument in the upcoming book, The Longevity Paradox, that in fact your brain up in your head should properly be called your second brain and that your first brain should be properly called your gut. Now that's a pretty bold statement, but uh, with the previous lecture we talked about the fact that around 90% of the cells that make you you are living in your gut and that 99% of all the genetic material in you is contained in your gut and your skin, not human cells. And that most likely we have uploaded information processing to our gut for most of the functions that we uh, need to do. Now, when I was in medical school, and even up until a few years ago, we knew that, we thought, that a lot of the hormones that affect our mood, uh, among others serotonin, and affect our sleep, uh, melatonin, Initially, we thought they were made in the brain, but then subsequent research showed that they, we thought that they were made in the neurons in the gut and then sent to the brain. Well, now it's clear that most of the hormones within us are actually made in the gut themselves by bacteria. And if we have the time, we'll talk about one of the amazing effects that Roundup glyphosate has had on poisoning our first brain. And I think that has huge implications on the rates of anxiety and depression that we currently have in, in our country and other Western countries. Okay, so, the basic concept of how the brain talked to the gut was that there was a very large nerve called the vagus nerve that ran from the, the brain down to the heart, down to the lungs, down to the liver, and then down to the gut, the intestines. And the brain, via the vagus nerve, would basically tell the gut what to do. It would control the motion of these smooth muscles that don't otherwise take orders via nerves. So it's basically uh, the old idea of cable uh, wiring your home or even electrical wires or telephone wires. There's literally a direct electrical signal that goes. Now, this is actually a fairly fast signal, as anybody who hits a hot plate or a hot fire, you get an instant burning sensation that goes to your spinal cord, actually never gets to your brain, and you immediately pull your hand away. So that goes via a cable. What 
we were taught is that this, is, this was primarily a one-way street. Brain told the gut what to do. Now, as I mentioned before, women are much smarter than this, and they have long known that the gut tells the brain what to do with a gut sense. And, of course, you were right. For every one wire going down from the brain, there's actually nine wires going up from the gut to the brain. And this was one of the first indications that perhaps we had it all wrong as to who was in charge. And so this is one of the first indications that probably the first, our first brain, our real brain, is down below. And this is an important, but second brain. Now, there's this cable system, or hard wire. And whenever I'm doing a podcast or a radio show, they always want me to be on a ground or ground link because cell phones are fairly unreliable. But we have a cell phone system. So the second way that we communicate information is via hormones. And hormones don't travel via wires. They travel via, if you will, blood vessels or lymphs. Or there's even a suggestion that they travel along meridians of electrical charges. But let's just say that, so the second message is text messaging. And they serve, and, and emails. So this is a, believe it or not, slower process than the hard wire. And it's more subject to misinterpretation because you have to have a tower or a cell phone that is capable of getting a good signal. And if you remember uh, anything we've talked about, how lectins may disrupt signaling, is that lectins, among other things, will bind onto a cell's receptor for a hormone and just stay there and block a hormone such as insulin, just to give you an example, from actually getting the information that it needs to get to a cell. And so both of these systems are very important. We used to think that most of the hormones that we make are made in the gut primarily, some in the brain, and they were made probably by specialized hormone producing cells. But with each passing year, as we're beginning to understand how elaborate the gut population is, the more we're realizing that it's actually the bugs in our gut that are responsible for making many of the hormones that communicate to our brain. So rather than a kind of top-down information system of the brain being in control of us, it's actually at least equal between the gut and the brain and I think, in terms of our short-term and long-term health, that both uh, the, the first brain down in the gut is probably the big winner long-term. I'll give you an example. I um, recently was visited by a very famous uh, meditator from Japan, a woman, who uh, is actually Deepak Chopra's representative in Japan, and she actually translates all his books. And she has suffered from a severe juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune condition. And she, it's so bad that she was on two immunosuppressants. She'd already had two knee replacements. 
uh, for her severe arthritis and she had such incredible pain that she really moved around with the help of a, a wheelchair and a walker. And she firmly believed that she could meditate her way out of this condition. And I think that's very admirable, uh, but clearly it wasn't working. She also followed a, an Ayurvedic diet and uh, with large amounts of brown rice and legumes as her principal diet. And she took all the usual suspects. She took lots of anti-inflammatories like turmeric and to no avail. And apparently she was in Vancouver, Canada last December when an acquaintance handed her the plant paradox. And she took it home and read it. And I met her in April of this year when she flew to meet me. Uh, beautiful young woman. She uh, walked into my office. Uh, she was on no medications. Uh, she was pain-free. And what had happened? Well, as much as her second brain tried to overpower what was happening down in her gut, this was actually the problem. And don't get me wrong, meditation actually works extremely well uh, for a lot of things, but meditation has yet to break into this first brain's barrier. And so when, when this brain is out of whack, uh, the consequences are severe across her and she's just one example. Let me give you a, a, a better example. We talked, there was a question on, on the last time about good bugs and bad bugs. So we know that there's, there's about 10,000 different species of bacteria so far identified in our gut. And there's probably well over a million different viruses that live in our gut. And, a nice smattering of worms and fungi. And we're just beginning to figure out what all these guys do, but we can classify them generally as good guys and bad guys. And you know, I call the good guys gut buddies and the bad guys gang members. And the gang members have different food requirements of the good guys. And what's so fascinating about the gang members, and this has been worked out very well in animal models, and there's a couple human models uh, that we can talk about. So the gang members love sugars, simple sugars, and they love saturated fats. Love them. The good guys can't live on this. And what we now know is that the gang members send text messages up to your brain, to your hunger centers. And the text messages basically say you're hungry. We want more to eat. And we actually want more of the things we eat. And we want more sugar and we want more saturated fats. And uh, those of you who have seen Little Shop of Horrors, uh, the movie or the play, the movie had Rick Moranis in it and an all-star cast, but the blood-sucking plant that poor Rick Moranis had to take care of wanted human blood, and her name was Audrey, and Audrey constantly got bigger and bigger and needed more and more blood, and she constantly said, feed me, Seymour, feed me, and poor Seymour had to go out and get her what she wanted. So we now know that the bugs in your gut actually tell you to feed them. Now, the converse is true. We know that the good bugs actually want these complex sugars, resistant starches, uh, inulin, which is a complex sugar, 
And they actually, if you give them what they want over a few weeks' time, they will actually kind of drive out the gang members and they'll start sending messages to your brain to feed them what they want. And I have so many men who are meat and potatoes guys that would never think of even having a salad um, within two or three weeks, maybe a month, They'll, they'll come in and see me and say, Doc, this is the weirdest thing. I crave salads. I can't go a day without having a salad. That's really weird, really weird. Well, it is really weird to think that this brain has more control over what you're actually seeking. You're actually seeking foods for whoever is in control of this brain. And this brain, in turn, controls this brain. And there's been some beautiful experiments with germ-free mice, where they've taken germ-free mice who don't have any bugs in their gut, and they give them feces from fat rats. Now, the nice thing about working with rats and mice is they love to eat each other's feces. I have a dog. Um, we won't go into that. Uh, and they just love it. So you don't have to give them enemas, fecal enemas. You just give them the other rat species. So they take the skinny mice, who are, and you give them the feces from obese mice. And lo and behold, the skinny mice will become obese. And this is actually, in, in The Lancet a few years ago, there was a case report of a woman marathon runner who I mentioned in The Plant Paradox, who was skinny. She developed uh, the severe intestinal infection called C. difficile or C. diff, which is the ultimate gang member. And she got it by getting a lot of antibiotics and it killed off all her good bugs and the gang member took over. So, one of the ways we treat that now is a fecal transplant. And a fecal transplant is exactly what it sounds like. We take feces from healthy volunteers. I was actually one in medical school uh, back in the dark ages at Georgia, where we actually used fecal transplants to cure this problem. And once a week, they would take around a honey bucket, we called it. And medical students would take a crap in it and then we'd put it in a wearing blender, a, a Vitamix, and homogenize it, and then we put it in an enema bag and shoot it up one of our patient's rear ends. So that's a fecal transplant. So it's now actually recognized